of you have noticed the new sign out front, and um, um, Andrew has sort of spearheaded that with the building committee um, to upgrade it. There's more to come. Um, there's going to be LED lighting at the bottom of it. And the sign originally um, was in honor of Carl Crockett, who is Shirley's dad. Um, and Shirley today has Sarah with her and Sarah's grandfather, um, Carl Crockett, and Helen Davis, um, the wife of Bob Davis, who most of you knew if you didn't know Helen. But it's also in memory of Judy Swan. I don't know if Don is listening online, but when Judy passed away um, several months ago, um, Don wanted to um, use gifts that were given in her memory to uh, give glory to God um, and to help the church. And so Don asked that the monies that all of you and others gave um, in memory of Judy be used to replace the sign. So we, we probably will have a Sunday when it's all done where we rededicate it um, in memory of, of Carl and of Helen and now of Judy to the glory of God. But just wanted you to be aware that those changes are taking place. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Isaiah. We've begun a, a new study of Isaiah. We'd been in it several years ago, and we're now back in it again. If you're using a pew Bible, it's found on page 714. 714, we're in chapter 1. So, And there are 66 chapters to this book, so I... I mapped it out, and I think I will be done when I'm 94 years old. <laughs> You're not supposed to say anything. <laughs> it's one of the times. <laughs> if you have your pew Bibles, it's um, 714, Isaiah chapter 1. I'm just going to, we're going to go from verse 10 all the way to verse 31. But let me just read verse 10 through um, 13. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my court? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moons and festivals and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you this morning, this is such a beautiful, beautiful book. Because even though it was written 700 years before the time of Jesus, it's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus. So as we study and read it, help us to see the good news. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, some of you are old enough To remember the scene in Casablanca with Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman. There's a scene where they're gathered in Rick's Cafe, and the crowd bursts out singing the Marcel Lyons, the French national anthem. And they burst out singing the French national anthem because over here in the corner, there were a group of Nazi soldiers gathered around the piano singing Nazi patriotic songs, while the French in the cafe sat there in silence. One of them stood up and began to sing the French national anthem, and everybody stood up. And if you remember that scene, everybody, at the loudest voices they could muster to overshadow the singing of the Nazi patriarchs, sang Marceau's Lyons, the French national anthem. And at one point, did I mispronounce it? Of course. At one point, 
the cameras go and they point to a woman and she's standing. But the camera catches her that she's singing it with passion. And as she sings it, tears begin to come down her cheeks. It's a rather moving scene, but it only makes sense if you remember the scene before this. Because earlier in the story, she'd, she had been, as a French woman, hanging on the arms of a Nazi soldier as his date. But when the opportunity came, she repented. And she took her stand with the French people in view of the Nazi soldiers. She took her stand to redeem herself. Redemption is so, so beautiful. To see a new human being rise from the wreckage is moving. The gospel, what we read in the Bible, is the story of redemption from Genesis 3.15 to the end of the book of Revelation. It's about redemption. But the difference between redemption in Casablanca and redemption in the Bible is that the stories in the Bible do not inspire us to redeem ourselves. The story in the Bible is a story about God redeeming us. The story in the Bible explains how God, holy and just, pays the price for our sins to redeem us. He pays the price on the cross through the death of his son Jesus so that we don't have to pay the price because we can't. That's redemption. Isaiah puts all his hope in redemption. If you look down at verse 27, Zion shall be redeemed by justice, and those in her who repent by righteousness. That's where Isaiah wants to take us. He wants us to take us to the picture of redemption. But Isaiah laments the church's corruption. Isaiah is speaking here in chapter 1 to the church of the Old Testament, people who claim to be God's people. And he asks, what? He asks them, what have you become? What does God want to do with people like you? And so Isaiah shows us the corruption of God's people. And yet, God's plan to redeem corrupt people. Verse 21 says, How the faithful city, how the faithful city has become a whore. And then verse 26 resolves the tension. Afterwards, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. God's plan is to take Israel, who had become a whore, and turn her back into a faithful city. That's redemption. And Isaiah aims to sober us by telling us the truth, but give us hope and who God is. His vision is both terrifying and it's beautiful. It's terrifying because he tells us the truth about who we are. It's beautiful because it tells us what God wants to do. He wants to redeem us. But it begins by a confrontation. In verse 10, we read, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, Give ears to the teachings of our God, you people of Gomorrah. We can imagine how the people of Israel responded to, God, to, to Isaiah when they heard that. What do you mean, Isaiah? We're, you're telling us we're rebellious? You're telling us we don't comprehend? You're telling us that we're sick and desolate? 
We're the people of God, Isaiah. Don't you know we're the people of God? Any, any problems, any small misgivings that we might have had with God certainly is compensated by our splendid worship in Jerusalem. You're overlooking, Isaiah, something that is to our credit. Certainly God considers us to be righteous because all that we do for him in the sanctuary. How can you say that we are like Sodom and Gomorrah? So the people probably felt Isaiah misunderstood them. I think Isaiah at that point stops and wants to make it more clear. He says, you're right. You're not like Sodom and Gomorrah. You are Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah had been a city in the Old Testament prior to Isaiah that God completely wiped out because of their sin. Completely wiped out. So Isaiah is intensifying his confrontation. And why? Why is Isaiah being so confrontational with the people of God? Because he wants the people and the rulers to start asking themselves new questions like, what have we become? Are we a light to the Gentiles? Yeah, in the sanctuary, we're doing everything right. Right in here, we're doing everything just biblically. But are we a light to the Gentiles? In our homes, do we give glory to God in the way that we live in our homes, in the marketplace, when we're out doing business, in all of our dealings and goings and comings, in all of life? Are we giving glory to God? Are people, as we live out our lives in the culture, are people seeing something of Jesus in us? And Isaiah is saying, I don't think so. And so he shakes the people of God at their very foundation so they can listen with new ears. And so with unsparing honesty, God tells Israel, the people of God, how he judges their worship. As I was studying this this past week, I read one commentator who said this, quote, of all the prophetic outbursts at religious unreality, this is the most powerful and sustained. Its vehemence is unsurpassed. End of quote. Let me read to you verse 11 again. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and fat and well-fed beasts. I do not take delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. God is saying, I've had enough. The New Living Translation says, I'm sick of your sacrifices. Today we would say, I've had it up to here. People of God would have said, wait a minute, God. We didn't come up with this form of worship. This form of worship that involves sacrifices, of burnt offerings, of rams, of fat, of well-fed beasts, of bulls and of lambs, that's not our idea. That's in the book of Leviticus. We're doing everything that you prescribed in the book of Leviticus. They are your sacrifices, God, just as you prescribed. And God says, no. Yes, you're doing everything biblically or what you think is biblical. And the people have said, don't you see the lavish inventory of worship materials? We have the blood of bulls. We have the blood of the lambs. We have the blood of the goats. And so Isaiah makes this careful catalog of sacrifices. The people of God thought, this is impressive. Look at all that we're doing for God. How unselfish. How impressive. But God says, I've had enough. I'm sick of your worship. Verse 12 says, when you come 
to appear before me, who has inquired of you this trampling of my court? A beautiful thing, such as the worship of God, can be trampled underfoot even though it's being done biblically. Jesus, too, was offended in Mark chapter 11 by the vulgarization of worship. He called it a den of thieves and robbers. When our lifestyle lived outside the sanctuary, when our lifestyle outside of Sunday morning doesn't match what we say and sing here, no matter how proper our observance may be, God is saying that to him, such worship has been spoiled as a trampling of my court. It's just the noise of people coming into the sanctuary. And he says, bring no more vain offerings. Bring no more incense. Your incense is an abomination to me. New moons and Sabbaths, the calling of convocations, I cannot endure your iniquity and your solemn assemblies. He wasn't talking about iniquity being done in the building. In the same, he was talking about how people live their lives out there. And so he says, when you spread out your hands, in verse 15, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. And so God makes the most damning charge in rejecting even their prayers because of what? Verse 15, your hands are full of blood. Your hands are full of iniquity. You say, I am your God. But when you go outside these four walls, you live as somebody else is your God. And why is God so blunt? Because he wants to redeem us. Our worship is not fine-tuning our outward performance. Our worship is not fine-tuning how we sing worship songs. Our worship is not fine-tuning how we sing as a congregation. Our worship is a matter of repentance. It's coming before God, understanding who we are, and understanding who he is. And so Isaiah talks about the corruption of the church. In verse 21, how the faithful city has become a whore. She who was full of justice has now become a whore. Christian believers, those of us who profess Christ as our Lord and Savior, are married to Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. His love for us is not some platonic attachment. It's passionate, it's marital love, it's claiming us for himself. We are the bride of Christ, Ephesians chapter 5. And when God calls us to himself, he's not flirting with you. He wants you to be his faithful bride in all of life, not just here on Sunday morning. And that's what Israel wasn't getting. So whenever we form other allegiances, we are committing spiritual adultery. We are acting as a whore. It's what Andrew was talking about last week when he was talking about putting idols in front of ourselves. When we leave this room, when we leave this place where we're worshiping and go out into the world and we begin to erect things in our lives that are more important to us than serving God in the world, those things that we erect, whether they be family, grandchildren, children, cars, 401ks, whatever they are, those become idols. And when we do that, God calls us a whore. We profess faithfulness to Christ. We're the bride. But when we leave, we go out and we commit adultery with the idols that we've erected. 
And that's why the word how stands at the beginning of verse 21. How the faithful city has become a harlot, a whore. The same word how begins at the book of Lamentations. How deserted the city once full of people has become. It's, it's a sign that Isaiah is lamenting. He's saying, how? How you are the people of God? How could you have allowed this to happen? You who were once filled with God's justice and righteousness are now a whore. How? The church has gone bad because of unfaithfulness to God. Not in the sanctuary, because of unfaithfulness to God in the world. And so Isaiah says, it was once full of justice, and it's now filled with murderers. People who act unrighteously. In 1925, Whitaker Chambers was a communist spy in the U.S. And he worked as an underground spy for Russia in the U.S. In 1939, he eventually turned against communism and pledged his loyalty to America and admitted that he had been a spy. Ronald Reagan, during his presidency, awarded him the Medal of Freedom for his value in exposing communist plots within the United States back in 1939, 1940, and thereafter. And Mr. Chambers wrote a book. It's called Witness. And in his book, he recalls this conversation. He talks about a former diplomat that he met in Moscow. And this former diplomat, who was a woman, was trying to explain to Chambers her father, who was once also a communist spy, and later had become unyielding anti-communist. And so this woman is explaining to Chambers about her dad. And she says this, quote, He was immensely pro-Soviet, she said. And then you will laugh at me, but you must not laugh at my father. And then one night in Moscow, he heard screams. That's all. Simply one night in Moscow, he heard screams. End of quote. Chambers goes on to comment. It's at that point he realized that all the Communist Party was promising was not happening. In fact, just the opposite. Instead, he, instead of delivering on well-being for all, it was the source of suffering and death. And so when her father walked the streets of Moscow, all she heard were screams. So my question to you this morning is, in the church, Do we ever hear the screams? I would suggest those screams are one of the reasons people leave the church. People become a part of the church because they read their Bibles and they say, this is how godly people are to act, with justice and righteousness, with love and with kindness. And they become a part of the church and they see everything looks nice on Sunday morning but then they see others leave the sanctuary, go out into the world, and leave, live lives completely different. And they see the hypocrisy. 
They hear screams where they should have seen justice and righteousness, love and mercy. All the Christianity was supposed to be, but is not happening. Isaiah is saying the church has become the exact opposite of what it was called to be. And because the church has become the exact opposite of what it was called to be, there are screams in the city. And people leave the church. Verse 22, Isaiah writes, Your silver has become dross, and your best wines are mixed with water. There's no substance to your faith. Yeah, here, Sunday morning, you do everything biblically. Good job. Out there, your silver has become dross, the wasted metal, and your best wines are watered down. There's no substance to them. God is trying to shake Israel out of its corruption and wake it up with truth. But when you come to verse 25 and 26, he speaks of our redemption. Listen to these words. I will turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all your alloy. And I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterwards, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. God intends to remove the deep stains of sin that are established in our lives. He longs to purify us and make us righteous with the righteousness of Jesus. But he takes his people through a refining fire. But his goal is to restore us as a faithful city. When God turns his hand against you, it isn't in disaster, it's an act of restoration. Isaiah wants us to know, he wants us to feel the weight of the decision, now knowing all this that we face. Will we dare follow God, even if it means being in the refining fire? Verse 27 and 28 read this. Zion shall be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent by righteousness. Zion will be redeemed by justice. God's justice must be met. Someone has to pay for my sins and your sins. And God's justice is met in Jesus. He pays the penalty. And by righteousness, by Jesus living in perfect obedience to the Father on your behalf and my behalf. Verse 28, but rebels and sinners shall be broken together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. God does not, re, God does not redeem us by casual sweeping under the carpet of our sins and saying, oh, your sins don't matter. Let's just sweep them under the carpet. No, he sent his son to die for my sins and your sins. Redemption comes not by God's leniency, but by his justice, by his righteousness, which is satisfied in Jesus. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all the lawlessness and purify for himself a people of his own possessions. We are redeemed at a cost to God, which we'll never comprehend. God gave his own son so that you could be redeemed. And Isaiah gives to the church an invitation. Verse 16 and 17. God's invitation to the church, wash yourself. Verse 16, make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. What's he saying? He's saying, wash your hands. Make yourself clean. 
Learn to do good. Seek justice out in the world. Correct oppression out in the world. Bring justice to the fatherless out in the world. Plead the widow's cause out in the world. Wash yourself. Make yourself clean with the righteousness of Jesus, but go out into the world and live like sons and daughters of the king. Our part, Isaiah is telling us, is to repent. And the only alternative he gives to us is in verse 28. But rebels and sinners shall be broken together. Those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. The question is, will we turn to God in repentance? In verse 29 and 31, Isaiah begs us to embrace repentance. And let's us see what happens if we don't. Let me read to you verse 29 and 31. For you shall be ashamed of the oaks that you desired, and you shall blush for the gardens that you have chosen. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers, and like a garden without water. And the strong shall become tender, and his work a spark, and both of them shall burn together with none to quench them. Israel might be saying, Isaiah, why do you keep pressing this point? Because Isaiah wants to make sure that they know that these are serious matters. And uh, Israel was saying, it really doesn't matter. What we do here on Sunday morning is, is all well and good. But God's saying, every moment of your life lived before me, whether it be in the sanctuary or out in the world, matters. Because all of life is to be lived unto the king. The key to the metaphor in verse 29 and verse 30 is verse 31. The strong and his work. The oaks and the garden. They're metaphors. They're metaphors for what we as humans think as we're strong. We can create our own strength. We can create our own pleasures. We can create our own beauty. And the point is that our own brilliance, our own desires, if pursued, will be the death of us because they're idols. Repentance opens up life. And the ways of God, the weakness of repentance, it seems weak to say, I am needy. It seems weak to say, I am weak. But God says, you can't come to me until you acknowledge that you are weak and needy. This is the good news of Isaiah. This is the gospel. It looks forward to the coming of Jesus, where God will wash away all of our sins by his death upon the cross. In the old hymn, we sing, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's not that blood is magical. There's nothing magical in blood. Blood represents life. And the only thing that can wash away your sins is Jesus dying in your place, symbolized by the word blood. Oh, precious is the flow that washes white as snow. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This morning, I don't know where each of you are at. You may be wondering to yourself, which way do I go? You may be far from God this morning. What you need to know this morning is there is, there is a Redeemer. There is a Redeemer. And there is a Heavenly Father who wants to redeem you. Call of Isaiah is to go to him. Acknowledge your need for redemption. Acknowledge your need to be redeemed and saved. Acknowledge that you are a sinner. And God will redeem you. God will redeem you. There is no other lamb. There is no other name. There is no other hope in heaven or on earth. And there is no other hiding place from guilt and shame. There is no other name but Jesus. He is our Redeemer. Let's pray.
Father God, as we come before you, we acknowledge how wonderful it is to be here in this place of worship. It feels so good to be able to be gathered, to sing songs, to hear your word, and it feels good. But Father, you call us to be a light to the nations. You call us to be salt to the earth. You call us to be your people in the creation. We even pray, Father, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Father, you call us to be yours. You redeem us as your children so that we might live before you in all of life, not just here on Sunday morning. So, Father, we come before you humbly. We acknowledge our need. We acknowledge our guilt and our sinfulness. We ask you to redeem us so that we might worship you here and that we might bring glory to you in all of life and how we live. For we ask in the name of Jesus.